Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Chrissy Clay, and I'm from the Australian Institute of Health Innovation at Macquarie University. Thank you for joining us. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands from which you are all joining us today. We pay our respects to our elders, past, present, and emerging, and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal cultures and customs and connections to the lands and waters. I'm coming to you today from the land of the Darug Nation. Thank you for joining us. So as we go along, please feel free to participate in our discussion by putting your questions into the Q&A and we will get to as many as we can after the presentation. Also, if you'd like to refer this uh, record, this webinar to a colleague, we will be recording and we'll be providing you with an automatic link directly after the webinar. So you'll be able to share that um, with colleagues or go back and look at it again. All right, so to get started, I'm very pleased to be able to hand you over today to our host, Dr. Kate Taruka. Hi there, thanks, Chrissy. Uh, so my name is Kate Taruka. I'm an NHMRC Emerging Leadership Fellow here at the Australian Institute of Health Innovation. And I'm delighted to be hosting um, this webinar, AIHI webinar series. Um, which is being presented by our wonderful, my wonderful colleague, Associate Professor Rima Harrison. Um, and her talk is going to be looking at how can we achieve diverse consumer engagement in health services research and improvement. Um, so the, the, as a background to this talk, the drive for person-centered healthcare to enhance safety and quality is gaining traction worldwide. And it's creating opportunities for healthcare consumers to inform health systems and the delivery of services and their governance. Um, these opportunities are being coupled with a growing recognition of the value of consumer engagement in um, conceptualizing and designing health services research. Um, so the session that Rima is going to be presenting today will be exploring what these opportunities mean, but specifically for people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, as well as current challenges and the approaches required to support their more meaningful engagement and involvement in this process. So Associate Professor Rima Harrison, um, our speaker today, leads the Healthcare Engagement and Workplace Behaviour Stream, um, which is a research stream of health services researchers here at the Australian Institute of Health Innovation at Macquarie University. Um, Rima is a mixed methods researcher with expertise in using co-design and participatory approaches with diverse populations, and is a Cancer Institute New South Wales Career Development Fellow. Rima leads translational health systems and services research with current projects funded by the NHMRC, Cancer Australia um, and the ARC. And these projects seek to address issues of equity to improve the safety and quality of healthcare. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to um, our speaker today, Associate Professor Rima Harrison. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kate, and thanks for joining the session today. So today I'm going to be exploring how we can achieve more diverse consumer engagement in health service research and improvement, and why this is valuable for addressing inequities in healthcare safety quality and ultimately in health outcomes. Um, so my talk's really focused on engaging with culturally and linguistically diverse consumers. I'm going to use the term CALD, because um, that's the term that we use uh, generally in Australia, and I know there's other terms out there. Um, so this is really focused on migrant communities, um, but some of the things I'm going to discuss have relevance for kind of general consumer populations and particularly those groups who are less heard within the healthcare system. So through the session, I'm hoping to cover these three areas. So firstly, really looking at the issues of um, equity and in, in healthcare and health outcomes for cow populations, uh, with a particular focus on safety and quality, because that's the focus of um, my research. And I'm going to talk a bit about how consumer engagement might be useful for addressing health inequities uh, and spend some time considering the challenges associated with consumer engagement for cow communities. Um, and then we're going to look at um, some possible solutions and, and some possible ways forward. So firstly, let's look at healthcare and health outcomes for cow communities in Australia. So 
along with many other countries, Australia has a highly multicultural society. Um, so around a third of Australia's population were born overseas uh, and just under half either were either born overseas or have parents born overseas. About 20% of people speak a language other than English at home and our society includes individuals from almost every country in the world. Um, so because of our population features, we've had increasing recognition of the importance of a health system in Australia that can respond to difference. So difference in terms of cultural, linguistic, faith-based needs and preferences. But when we look at healthcare and health outcomes for Cal communities, we see a number of disparities when you compare that to the general population. So there are many examples out there in the healthcare sector in Australia and beyond um, in which Cal populations experience poorer health outcomes and also examples of problems in care that contribute to these. Um, so on this slide, I've just put some recent kind of figures from the US, the UK and Australia. Um, a lot of that's focused around access to preventive health services, delays in diagnosis and treatment, um, poorer prognosis for some conditions. But there's also a kind of higher incidence of some conditions um, and a lot of our work is in, in cancer and some of these figures relate to that. Um, there's also some contributors in terms of intersectional disadvantage with lower socioeconomic status often being discussed in the context of Cal communities, but it's, it's not always a factor for all Cal communities. So the area that my team particularly focuses on is healthcare safety and specifically um, the harms that Cal populations are often exposed to in the course of their healthcare. So our review of international literature published a couple of years ago um, shows that across multiple countries, people from Cal backgrounds tend to experience more safety problems in their care, um, particularly things around medication administration, management, healthcare acquired infections. But there's also a wide range of communication errors and, and they have knock on effects for um, a whole range of areas of care. Um, what was notable in the, the review that we did was that the definition of Cal is not universal. And so because you have different definitions from one country to the next, um, depending on that population profile, you find different things in, in different kind of locations in the world. So in Australian studies, CAL is often defined as having a language other than English as a first language, being born overseas, having parents born overseas. Um, but it's also notable that ethnicity and race are mentioned, particularly in studies in the UK or in the US. Um, so that shapes some of this knowledge and what we know about some of the disparities in um, healthcare safety and, and health outcomes. We know there's other factors such as migration status and time spent in a country that are pertinent to the kinds of safety events that occur. Um, but data about migration status and time spent in a country is not often captured um, and, and not consistently, particularly in studies where you're relying on administrative data. Um, so we know there's some work by the ABS in Australia who are um, looking at setting standards for cultural and linguistic diversity. And hopefully that's going to um, start to address some of those issues and that lack of information. In addition to the review work, we've also spoken with consumers through a range of qualitative um, research conducted in lots of languages with lots of different communities. And through that work, what comes through is consumers' sense of feeling unsafe in the healthcare system. And there's a wide range of factors that seem to contribute to those feelings of, of not being safe within the healthcare system. Um, and what is clear from those conversations is that those kind of one-to-one -one interactions with health professionals can either create a really strong sense of safety or, or can um, create a feeling of, of not being safe rather than kind of experiencing a particular safety incident. We've also done some retrospective review work in uh, cancer services in New South Wales and in Victoria. Um, so these review findings really reflect the kind of wider problems that we've noted in terms of medication safety and also the wider issues in communicating with healthcare teams and health services. And what's notable in this work is that um, harmful events are often documented when an interpreter is needed, and um, particularly if the medical documentation is not consistent about whether an interpreter is needed or not. Um, what's really interesting to note is the numerous occasions in which patient behaviour is described as a factor in safety events. So commonly this is um, when patients are described as not following the advice of a health professional. But when we actually look at the detail of the documents that we've reviewed, it, it's really apparent to us that in many of those situations, there's a lack of shared understanding between patients and families and clinicians about the course of action that was actually expected of the patient, um, rather than a deliberate decision not to um, follow that particular course of action. So those are just a few examples of the safety and equities that we've been looking at and the kind of wider body of work around inequity in healthcare and um, outcomes. Um, 
What's notable across the body of work from, from our work and, and wider bodies of work is a diverse combination of factors that seem to be influential in individuals' experience of healthcare and their outcomes. And our lack of knowledge about how these factors collectively or cumulatively impact care. But one thing is clear is that the number of healthcare quality issues that arise for um, Cal communities need to be addressed so that healthcare is as good and safe as it can be. When it comes to trying to address some of these equities, what I'm going to talk about is the approach that we often pursue in trying to improve healthcare and health outcomes for Cal communities in health services research and also in in service improvement approaches. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about how more diverse consumer engagement might contribute to this and ways to perhaps get there. We often seek to improve healthcare um, by making cultural adaptations to things that we know work for the wider population. So that could be adaptations to health promotion programs, to service delivery models in the community or hospital settings, and, and many more things. We make cultural adaptations by adjusting features of a current approach while trying to maintain the fidelity of the intervention that we've put into play. And there's many techniques out there about how we can create cultural adaptations so that people from Cal communities can realise the benefits of known effective interventions. Um, and just as an aside, you know, at the moment, we're pretty well versed in targeting groups through this approach, uh, less so in considering diversity within individuals uh, and the inter and intergroup diversity between uh, people from Cal backgrounds and also the intersectionality they often experience. One approach called the cultural sensitivity model highlights important considerations in thinking about cultural adaptations in terms of kind of this idea of surface culture and deep culture. I'm going to talk a bit more about those in a moment. And the argument is that both aspects of culture should be assessed and potentially addressed when you're trying to determine whether a cultural adaptation is going to be suitable and what changes need to be made and whether it's likely to work. And we need engagement with diverse communities to be able to address those questions. And I'm going to come to that in a moment. So first, we might like to think about cultural uh, service issues and then looking at making some initial adaptations there. With surface culture adaptations, you can think of that as essentially culture that's kind of easily identifiable. So it might be types of music, art, uh, language, dialect attributed to a particular cultural group or a particular geographic location. So these kinds of adaptations will be really familiar to, to people listening. You know, um, they're often made to health services interventions and improvement processes. And it might be things like translating study information, uh, service information, or creating an environment or materials that are more suitable or welcoming for people from particular cultures through artwork. And engagement with individuals and community groups is required to do this well and to do it appropriately. But then there's elements of culture that are kind of beliefs and feelings and attitudes that we learn by being a member of that particular group. Um, it's often kind of personal values, relationships that are expressed in actions and in words of day-to-day -day life. And this can be described as deep culture. So it describes cultural norms that are not easily detected unless you've really been embedded in that culture for some time. So perhaps there's someone born in that culture or raised in that particular culture. It's much harder to adapt to current intervention to address deep culture. You generally need to incorporate cultural values and ways in the design and the implementation of the uh, intervention or service change approach and potentially involve different actors and, and messages in interventions such as family um, to create ways of thinking that are relevant for that particular group. We picked up a boat of both kind of surface and deep culture issues in a recent piece of work, and this might help to um, exemplify that. So we were looking at whether we could adapt patient safety interventions to be more suitable for Cal communities and cancer services. So we started off with a literature review and identified 27 interventions that tried to improve safety by encouraging deeper involvement from patients and families in care. Um, and then we workshop those approaches with a range of individuals and community groups um, who were able to give perspectives of a whole range of different child community backgrounds. And whilst the groups identified a number of surface ways to adapt current approaches, so there were examples um, where we could adapt the modality of the approach, we could add images, we could translate key information or provide information in different modes like text messages. There were also some deeper issues that we couldn't so readily address in a simple adaptation. Um, perhaps some of it could be addressed by adapting some of the content. And then there were some more fundamental issues in how we conceptualise things like risk and safety in healthcare and engagement. 
And all of that influences not only why cow communities need to be engaged with research and improvement approaches um, in the interest of addressing health inequities, but also the kind of engagement needed if we're looking to try to, um, to make changes in our research and our practice. So engagement is really important with diverse communities to ensure that people who are affected by a particular health condition or um, a service change are contributing to decision making about changes um, to that particular intervention or service change so it's going to improve um, their experiences and their outcomes. Before I go further into consumer engagement, I'm just going to clarify what I'm referring to. So consumer engagement has been conceptualized in many ways, and that's another talk in itself. Um, but you can see a bit of an evolution of the concept here from kind of early work in public participation through to recent or more recent US work, and then some local work actually by um, groups in Sydney to try to conceptualize a range of ways of thinking about engagement, and different avenues to engagement. There's lots of ways in which um, engagement can happen with health services uh, teams or researchers. Um, but I like to think about consumer engagement as being consumers involved in decision making, be it decisions about one's own health, about health service research, policy, service improvement. Um, so you know, those decisions influence intervention design or intervention or service design, research design or a policy that's going to come. Um, I know early models talked about engagement as a continuum from kind of no engagement through to deep engagement. And there's always been a sense that consumer partnership and ideally leadership is the strongest form of engagement. I think you can also think about different types of engagement as being complementary for, to different types of purposes and different decision making activities. So if we're trying to understand whether a current intervention approach is suitable for a particular cow population, we might go about engagement for that purpose in a different way than if we're trying to um, establish and design something um, that's completely new, a new program or a new project. So we need consumer engagement with cow communities to ensure that we design health services and interventions that are going to be suitable. Um, and how do we go actually about doing that? So, I'm going to focus here really on engagement with system services and research rather than kind of individual health decision making, uh, because that's the, the main areas that, that we're involved with. Um, so we did a review of consumer engagement frameworks and identified really that these are the kinds of activities that are recommended to take place. And I appreciate there's some overlap in different areas and, and different ways of understanding how these processes might work um, at the kind of different levels of engagement, you know, from informing through to kind of leading. But when you drill down to these engagement activities, many of the proposed activities, um, especially when you come to that kind of involvement, collaboration, leadership end, requires groups to come together to meet, to do some work, to target health service or a system issue. And then you end up with kind of workshops, working groups, committees. And it's increasingly recognized that those participating in those groups do really vast and incredible work um, but don't necessarily always reflect the cultural diversity of the Australian population or the population for whom the, um, the targeted approach is supposed to be addressing. And there are some barriers um, that we need to overcome to try to achieve more diverse and representative um, membership of these kinds of groups. So we've established that we need to be able to um, address um, the consumer engagement activities might present some challenges for cow populations um, and that we actually need those consumer engagement activities to, to inform some of the things that we're trying to improve in terms of health services and interventions to improve ultimately the outcomes and, and care that's provided as well. So I'm going to focus on a few key challenges that we've recognised through our work. It's not exhaustive. I know there's a lot of things out there that are affecting people in, in various different ways. But to me, you know, thinking about this talk, it was what are the areas that are really broadly relevant to health services research improvement um, and that might be the kind of immediate issues that we might start to look at. So we know from our programme of work and the work of many others that there are barriers faced by cow communities to engage in healthcare and that those barriers are at every level. Um, there's often issues accessing the healthcare system and then further systemic and interpersonal experiences that limit engagement in healthcare encounters. But all of that means that we can't simply transfer the current engagement activities, whether those activities are actually in direct care, at a system level, in a research team. Um, we can't just transfer those 
uh, activities to health communities without some consideration of the challenges that um, that might bring. Um, and we need to work out how to create an inclusive space that can take into account different perspectives and ways of interacting and different ideas. So as I say, this section is not exhaustive. These are kind of, to me, the immediate issues that um, certainly I'm coming up against, um, you know, on a very regular basis. Um, and I believe they come across um, some of the immediate issues that, that many uh, research teams and system improvement teams are experiencing. Um, and I certainly don't have all of the answers to how to address these current challenges, but I'm going to um, cover these areas and introduce a few approaches that we've tried out where they're relevant. So one of the big outcomes of the shift into recognising the value of consumer engagement in health systems has been the creation of multiple mechanisms to facilitate engagement. So increasingly, as I said, there's consumer advisory groups, working groups and panels to conceptualise projects and to make decisions about how to improve care. Achieving diversity in these groups remains a challenge and often there might be, you know, a person or one or two people representing the CAL perspective. And that's really not sufficient in the context of a multicultural society. We need to be able to bring together groups of individuals with a diverse range of cultural, linguistic, personal, faith experiences and perspectives to better reflect our society. But we often have challenges in identifying and connecting with people beyond our own networks, especially uh, those who are less visible um, kind of at the societal level. There's a tendency to rely on a handful of engaged people that a team or an organisational group can access. And that's not to say, you know, those those individuals do great work, but it's about trying to look at how we can diversify those networks. Cal communities are often, not always, but often among those who have less social capital. So, you know, being born and raised in a particular place, where you live, where you went to school, your university, your educational status, and um, all of those things generate social capital and networks that connect you with the society and its systems. And there's not a single kind of set, agreed set of variables of social capital. But in health, they tend to centre around the areas that I've outlined on this slide. For people from a migrant background, many of those connections are experienced differently. And whilst some people might have really strong connections and extensive networks that lead into health and health services, many don't. Um, and acknowledging the role of social capital and access to and then participation in consumer engagement activities is really critical. Um, we have to consider how, diverse, how to diversify our networks um, as researchers, people doing service improvement, to make new links. Um, and we might need to use different strategies and, and go about things in a, in a completely different way than we have before to try to get there. So not really just accessing known kind of groups and networks, but trying to um, get into communities and, and get to individuals to inform long lasting relationships that build up over quite a long period of time to build that basis of um, kind of trust and mutual benefit. And the relationship really does need to have mutual benefit um, must be sustained and it's not just the time of all those relationships and all these things, probably into any plan of consumer engagement activity. Once we've got a particular activity in mind, the issues of remuneration and resource and support are essential already to consider if we want to make it suitable and accessible for a range of people. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about here it is relevant to all consumer groups, um, but has particular, um, there are particular things that are experienced by cow populations within this as well. There's three key areas that I've outlined here. Um, firstly, remuneration. So reimbursement is fairly well established, I'd say, in consumer engagement. Certainly a growing appreciation of and avenues to support remuneration as well, um, but that's not always the case. Um, the considerations for cow communities around um, remuneration are also not well articulated so there's some really useful advice about, you know, what should be paid um, for what kinds of activities, but not necessarily considering some of the specific uh, things that our populations experience. So how does that advice about consumer pay payment reflect the impact of language and health literacy on time taken to complete tasks? Um, does being paid mean that you can only access a certain type of voucher or require extensive paperwork to be registered as an employee? And what are the repercussions of that for trying to include a diverse range of people within an activity? And then the second is about support that cloud consumers might need to be able to prepare for meetings. So when this involves time from another person uh, or the creation of more accessible materials, who's covering those costs? 
these are kind of frequent problems, well-recognized problems, but they're enduring obstacles to trying to um, actually achieve diverse groups um, engaging activities and achieve good engagement in those activities. And so the third aspect of supporting engagement is how the activity or the role is kind of set up. And this bears relevance to all consumer contributors, but has particular implications for some CAL groups. A particular one is creating an environment that makes it easy and comfortable for individuals to contribute. We're all different. So do attendees know what's being requested of them? Who's going to be there? And is somebody going to facilitate their contribution, especially if it's in another language? And it's, it's hard to cut in um, when English is not your first language, but also there are different kind of cultural expectations about doing that. And so really, you know, strong chairing from somebody who is mindful to those kinds of different issues is incredibly important. So we've tried a few things, um, particularly in the area of kind of creating an environment for engagement. And this is not to say that all of these things are going to work for every project and, and they're not the only things. Um, but some things that we found helpful have been, you know, clearly articulating the role that consumers might take overall, not only for the consumers involved, but actually for us to really think through before we start an activity, before we think about engaging with anybody, and um, you know, what is the purpose of this and what is that role going to look like? And, and can we kind of capture that um, in something brief, but really clear? And then what's the activity and what's the role in a particular session um, and what we're trying to achieve um, and, and what's the value for all parties in doing that? Um, having individual conversations between any larger group discussions, clear reference information developed for consumers or just accessible information for everybody is really important. Um, and having really well planned activities with somebody to facilitate contributions, either as a key contact or more directly involved in those conversations. We've found those strategies have helped us to have um, a more productive and successful engagement process then. The last issue I want to discuss links back to the wider concept of kind of social capital, and it's about skills that are kind of implicitly or explicitly required for engagement activities. So these skills often mean you get access to the activity in the first place, or that when you're actually in the engagement, you hold some, um, some power. Um, and so they're really critical. So with an increasing number of consumer roles, there's often a requirement for interviews and even applications to get into the process. Um, most commonly written, sometimes followed up with a phone or an in-person conversation. So these types of processes um, have value in some ways, but um, they can actually put those with less familiarity of the systems, local systems or environment, or less familiarity of workplaces at a disadvantage. And success in accessing positions through these types of arrangement are often contingent on some degree of English literacy, um, people who've got the time and often computer access to put in an application. So it immediately rules out many potentially really relevant and suitable people. Primarily the goal of these processes is to determine suitability and to manage large volume of applicants and also to you know, provide a bit of information about what the task is. So yeah, a brief phone call by a bilingual or multilingual field worker or with a translation, a translator um, would be sufficient to increase access in many of those situations. Um, but then once in the process of engagement, there's a range of skills required to take part in and be heard and be valued as a member of the group. I think we need to be um, mindful of that. So some of the things that we, um, we learn, we learn through really working with people who do this well in the healthcare system. So um, we've done some work with um, some healthcare um, workers and health services uh, where people show really kind of high levels of cultural competence. Um, and we've also learned through our own work and evaluations of um, engagement um, approaches that we've taken about things that have helped us to have um, more successful engagement when in an engagement activity. Um, and some of those things are, are kind of quite broad, um, but they really consistently come through. And so really the first thing is coming back to the importance of kind of foundations of trust and respect as a, a prerequisite for the engagement. Um, and really that can take a lot of time. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, and foundations of trust and respect are ultimately built on, you know, having um, relationships that um, hold some value for all of those people who are engaged in that relationship. So, um, so that takes time, but it's something that clearly comes through. It's particularly important when working with our communities. Um, 
And then it's kind of creating strategies to facilitate interaction. And, and we learn a lot from working with uh, healthcare workers um, who work working with multiple to health teams particularly, uh, who really uh, been able to inform us around how to create strategies to facilitate interaction. And, and some of that is, you know, the actual activities you're going to do in a task, but a lot of it is actually around the environment. So, um, you know, where these um, engagement activities occur, are, are the locations that are easy to um, access, that kind of facilitate dialogue, and particularly that facilitate informal networking before or in between tasks. Um, that certainly comes through as incredibly important for kind of building up uh, a strong, engaged group of people and um, who are able to, to work with different opinions. Um, and then tasks that are readily completed by people from a range of different backgrounds. Um, and so that's where it's really been valuable to work with um, consumers who are co-facilitating activities or who are taking the lead for activities to actually think about what activities are going to be suitable for everybody to take part in and how that might then play out. Um, and then really finally, you know, taking the time to actually think about um, what relationships you're wanting to build rather than trying to build up um, a particular group for one specific kind of project or task. It's actually taking the time to form relationships um, and to actually um, invest in people and in communities to try to grow those networks. And that being kind of the basis of actually having effective engagement activities when those come later down the line. So I'm going to um, wrap up in a moment. I'm just going to go on to kind of a, a last slide, which is really um, more thinking about kind of the context for diverse consumer engagement. And I think, you know, this is just some, um, I guess, some thinking work. So anybody who's kind of a health service researcher or who's working in um, health service doing some improvement work, trying to just do some thinking um, really broadly, you know, before doing any kind of engagement activity or, or thinking about um, pursuing a particular um, project, you know, just trying to understand, okay, what is the nature of consumer engagement that we actually need for what we're doing? So yes, we know that consumer engagement is, is useful and helpful to achieve many different outcomes, but what's the outcome that we're actually trying to achieve through this work? Are we trying to do priority setting in kind of a policy area or are we seeking partnership on a research project or is it about people's experiences of a health service or a condition um, or is the role a governance role? And, and what are the roles and tasks of consumers for trying to actually um, progress that? Um, you know, who do, who do we have access to? Who might we need access to? And how could we actually build up a, a broader range of people to be involved in these activities? Um, what kind of support might people need? Um, how are we going to reimburse their time? How are we going to remunerate their time? Um, and how are we going to actually start to build and sustain relationships? So, okay, we have certain meetings that happen quarterly, um, but you know, how do we actually build relationships through that rather than just have that quarterly meeting where we sit in a big group online or round a table and, and you know, don't really have much contact in between that time? Um, you know, it's about trying to develop something, something bigger than just that activity. I think, you know, from my perspective, these are a few questions to really start to consider in a very broad way about what kind of engagement you want to have and then how to get there. So a lot of the things that I've um, talked about today have really been drawn from uh, work that we've done as part of the um, Can Engage project. So I'd like to just acknowledge all of the people who are involved in, in that project and in related projects, um, particularly, um, you know, um, Ash and Bronwyn and Catherine, who are um, part of the day-to-day um, -day project team and, and doing a lot, of, a lot of the work that we've reported today. Um, we also have a consumer advisory group, a co-facilitator network, a project advisory group, and multiple health system um, and service partners, and a range of funding sources that I should also acknowledge. Um, I'm going to come to the um, Q&A in a moment, so if you'd like to um, consider any um, aspects of the presentation or any of the issues raised and you have some questions, look forward to kind of hearing um, your questions and your comments. Um, and I'm going to leave some contact information here. Um, so if there's anything that you don't want to ask in the kind of Q&A here, but you'd like to follow up with, really happy to respond to by email or via Twitter. So I'm going to wrap up there and I'll um, hand over to um, Kate for the Q&A. 
Thank you so much, Rima. That was such an um, interesting and important um, discussion of the like the different strategies that can be used to kind of ensure that we have more meaningful engagement with consumers and particularly with cold populations. Um, I think you know what's been happening recently in Melbourne with the um, the tragic death of the little girl in a hospital in um, there down there is kind of really showing the the, the importance of of engagement and of having sort of ensuring that things are culturally safe for the diverse people that come through our health system. So, um, yeah, I guess I actually wanted to take advantage of my role as host to start by asking you a question, if you don't mind. Um, so I had quite a few questions I could ask, but um, one of the things that really stood out to me was actually quite early on in your presentation, and it was a very stark point that had me thinking about that recent case um, about these people not feeling um, safe in the health system and you know none of us like going to hospital or going to the doctor but a lot of the time top of mind isn't that we're unsafe and so I just thought that was you know like a very powerful and saddening idea and I, I was interested because you kind of mentioned that there was interviews and stuff that led to these findings as kind of a, a demonstration of this these strategies that you use could you give us a very brief sort of summary of how you build in um, engagement strategies into a research study like that yeah so in terms of people feeling um unsafe it was interesting because people would give um kind of accounts of situations that they've been in within healthcare but really the feeling of being unsafe was coming from um, feeling that they were not being um, acknowledged, heard, listened to about problems arising in their um, care. And there's a whole range, I mean, there's a kind of a vast range of research about why that might be. Um, and, you know, it, it's different in every situation. But certainly that sense that um, concerns are not necessarily being taken um, seriously that people are not being um, understood in terms of what their healthcare concern is that they've maybe gone to um, one particular health professional about um, an issue at one point in the system and then not necessarily have that information carried through elsewhere and um, so a whole range of reasons why people are not feeling safe within those systems and in terms of actually kind of gathering that data I think that the thing that we have found the most valuable has been being able to access um, people and speak to them within their um, preferred language. So many people are doing interviews in the language that they um, speak most comfortably in. And when you speak most comfortably in that language, it's a lot um, it's a lot easier to kind of express your thoughts and your views. So we've really relied on the um, amazing support we've had from people who are multilingual field workers and bilingual field workers to be able to actually do that research. I think it would be um, impossible without them and without the advice and the support that we get from the multicultural health teams who are in policy roles and also in health services who just have that, that kind of perspective and experience of a whole range of different cultural groups and individuals within those groups they're working with. I mean, we're absolutely, uh, you know, relying on that their advice and support is incredibly valuable to be able to do the research as well. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a, a couple of people who seem to be from New Zealand. So welcome to our seminar from, you know, over the pond. So um, I have a question here from um, someone who's asked, so my organisation, um, this is Mr. Sean McNeil, I hope you don't mind, um, but you put your organisation. So uh, my organisation, the Health and Quality Safety Commission, are informing a bill um, which will mandate a, in legislation that health entities must act in accordance with a code of expectations for health entities to engage with consumers. Um, and he's wondering if there's something similar happening in Australia to legislate for this engagement of consumers in health entities. Well, I think increasingly there's a, a shift towards this kind of requirement for consumer engagement, um, and, and which is which is a good thing, but also as I, as I say, creates some unintended consequences as well. I think um, you know certainly there's a there's a requirement for consumer engagement in certain activities and in certain kind of governance roles and, and certain um, positions. I think sometimes when there is that kind of mandated requirement for consumer engagement, there's there's, there's the risk that 
the reason and the purpose of that consumer engagement and the value that's going to be achieved for the consumer and for the wider population benefiting is not necessarily um, always kind of clear to everybody involved, not necessarily as thought through, and that people are sometimes um, identified in a bit of a a bit of a hurry to try to um, identify suitable people. So, um, yeah, I certainly see that there's, there's increasingly those kinds of requirements in a whole range of different organisations. Every health system is a little bit different in terms of, you know, way, the way that the governance kind of might work. Um, but, yeah, there are some, there's some, there's some risks and there are some good things that come with, with those kinds of roles. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've talked about it, sort of the potential for the box ticking sort of exercise when it comes to consumer engagement rather than ensuring that it's actually meaningful. So, yeah. Um, so I have another question here from someone from New Zealand um, who was asking, who's mentioned that their role is in government's uh, consumer health forum in, the New, in New Zealand, and they're looking at models of upskilling consumers in health. I'm wondering if sort of there's anything similar being done in Australia and if you have potentially any examples? Yeah, look, there's, there's a lot of work that's really around kind of capacity building amongst consumers and, and some of it's been going on for a really long time and some of the thinking's kind of more recent. Um, so in terms of kind of ups, upskilling consumers in the longer term, there's been and there's, there is increasingly um, a number of activities by organisations such as Consumer Health Forum, Health Consumers New South Wales and other kind of consumer groups where there's training at Cancer Institute do it as well, where there's training around how to be a consumer, um, you know, depending on what the role is, how to be a consumer on a particular committee or how to review research as a consumer, how to be a member of a research team, all of those kinds of things. Um, and then there's this kind of shift towards consumer leadership and there's been discussion around that for you know, 15 years or more. Um, around this idea of consumer leadership. But I think more recently you can see it starting to kind of um, take, take a little bit more momentum. And um, something that we've been um, trying to do and that we've done within our work has been trying to um, build capacity in consumers, because we obviously do a lot of research together, in being able to kind of facilitate workshops, um, workshops, co-design particularly workshops, so that we have a consumer facilitator or a couple of facilitators who are actually um, having a significant um, role to play within those sessions where we're trying to co-design something um, and also if we're trying to do um, you know more general research like things like focus groups um, and the way that we've gone about that is really trying to um, obviously build up kind of knowledge and skills of research but also to build up some um, knowledge and skills and capabilities around you know, things like the use of different technology and platforms, because we're doing a lot of stuff online, um, techniques for facilitation, um, you know, how to actually structure a session. And we do a lot of that through, um, we do some formal training, but we also do a lot of um, mentoring and support as we work through a process together. So within a co-design, we'll meet regularly with the people who are involved on a one-to-one -one basis and to spend some time actually building up some more um, tangible and specific skills in that way. So um, we found those to be, um, so far, um, really helpful in terms of being able to encourage discussion when we're in um, like a, a co-design workshop um, and we're in the process of, you know, we've done some evaluation around it and we're doing more. And I feel like we're always learning. Every time we try something new, we're always learning and trying to evaluate that and just see if we can uh, if we can improve it and, and make it work more effectively. Yeah, you mentioned something um, about sort of doing this, you know, you do the research and then you also evaluate the process of your, you know, engagement strategies and stuff. What does that look like? How do you go about that? <laughs> well, my, I mean, my sense is that nothing's ever really new. You know, this stuff's been going on for you know, more than 50 years. You know, people have been interested in the idea of, you know, public participation and, and, and you know, consumerism first and then moving into, you know, different ways of kind of describing and thinking about that. And so there's a lot to be learned from existing techniques and approaches that are used um, to kind of improve engagement or um to undertake kind of consumer-based activities from lots of different sectors. Um, and we don't necessarily apply that knowledge really well in healthcare. So a lot of what we do is think about, okay, what's kind of been shown to work in, in other areas? And a lot of the time, you know, we're looking at things like social work and in 
other other sectors and um, the design design sector as well has got a lot a lot of wealth of knowledge actually that's out there and we try some of those strategies within kind of you know our particular research project or particular study and um, you know we always make sure that we've, we've got ethics approval to not only try and do something new but also see if it's worked because then we can provide a bit of evidence to share that more broadly and say okay this worked or actually this didn't work um, or this worked but it would have been better if um, so we try and, and keep that as a, a parallel process so that we're continually um, building up that bank of knowledge about how to do what we do as well as actually trying to do the research that we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Very admirable. Um, I wanted to go back to something that you brought up early on in the, well, not early on, sort of midway through your presentation. I think it was the, the model of adaptation of interventions and sort of surface level versus deep. And I guess I wanted to understand a little bit more, is that underpinned by an assumption that in an ideal world, the deep adaptation is always the best option? Because it seemed to me there was sort of trade-offs in that the evidence base then becomes increasingly not not necessarily helpful beyond that point. So I guess you know, is there is there situations where surface adaptation is appropriate and then deep adaptation is appropriate? Yeah, I mean, look, there's a couple of things there. That's I mean, it's, it's a good question. There's a couple of things there that are worth thinking about. So, so firstly, you know, the point around is it always better to have deep deep adaptation? Well, not necessarily because you know, there are some things that it's completely suitable to take an existing intervention and simply, you know, if the materials um, kind of, you know, appropriate for people from a whole, from the particular cultural group you're going to try and intervene with, um, you might just adapt, you know, the, the language or adapt the design or, you know, of the way that materials look. And, you know, that's something that you can do by understanding from people from those communities you know, whether those adaptations would be suitable. What that model is suggesting really is that you need to assess both aspects. Because if you try to just do surface adaptations with something that is fundamentally not considered relevant or suitable for that particular population, then actually really this intervention overall isn't, isn't the right way to go. And it kind of speaks to the, the wider issues of, you know, when we're designing and building interventions in the first place, are we doing it with data from people from a diverse range of backgrounds that represent the populations who ultimately may need to um, benefit from this particular intervention. So I think it, you know, it raises a whole range of questions there. Um, and then in terms of, you know, I just think about the, the example that, that we had, which was really around trying to improve, um, you know, we're trying to improve patient safety um, and we're trying to improve it by improving engagement in healthcare. And I think, you know, when we were speaking to people from a range of CAL groups, um, the idea of what patient safety is and whether it really um, is pertinent in the way that we were conceptualizing it came up a lot, um, especially people who, you know, recently come from, um, you know, seriously traumatic situations and come over to um, a healthcare system where, you know, in the scheme of things, that wasn't a huge risk. Um, you know, those issues certainly came up in our workshops. And the other thing that came up was, you know, engagement, this idea of what consumer engagement is, it's been conceived in you know, particular cultural context. Um, and actually that isn't necessarily what other people um, or everybody might, you know, might want. So, um, you know, the idea of what consumer engagement was, was actually very different for the different groups of people that we spoke to. And it made us really think about, okay, do we need to adapt these interventions that are already out there? Or are we actually trying to design something completely new because it might not even be the right way to go? wholly depending on the groups that we're working with so yes it's, there's so much that goes into it it's really fascinating um so i have a, a question here from patricia greenway um who's asked she's asked a couple of things but i might start with her second question if that's okay um so is there work that's being done on consumer reported outcomes from a diversity perspective that you're aware of <laughs> so consumer reported outcomes as in kind of patient reported outcome measures for particular conditions is generally the kinds of problems that there are. So they're generally done for a particular condition. Um, sometimes they're done for a particular service. Um, from what I've seen, and like I say, you know, I'm sure there is stuff out there. Um, I haven't necessarily seen a particular 
um, focus to diversity when thinking about patient reported outcomes. Again, it, it, it seems from what I've seen that more often than not, there's let's do patient reported outcomes for, let's say, a particular treatment, um, mm -hmm. and then let's see if it works for our populations. And that's often the thinking, and that kind of comes back to the whole, you know, surface adaptations and, and, and deep adaptations and, and thinking about kind of culture in different ways. Um, so that's probably all I can really say on that particular one. No worries. Um, so another question I have here is, um, so how would someone convince their organisation to dedicate the time commitment required um, to build the relationships with sort of vulnerable and um, cowed communities in diverse communities? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's where the value comes in around kind of mandating engagement. I think it's that thing of going, OK, so so what are what is driving organisations to do that? Well, they're driven generally by things like especially health service organisations, you know, accreditation, policy requirements, national standards. So we've got obviously the partner and patients national standard, you know, and in there increasingly there is kind of consideration and thinking about. And we've certainly seen that over the last kind of couple of years much more kind of thought to particular populations that are not necessarily um, having you know equitable quality of care outcomes and um, so once those organizations are starting to really lead the way in terms of you know setting the bar around diversity and um, that's then encouraging organizations to, to take those things into consideration I still think you know not having um, resourcing um, that's suitable to ensure that people can engage and it becoming this kind of um, this thing that takes up a lot of time and that's difficult. I think there's still a bit of perception around that and, and that's tricky. Um, but um, I do think we're on the right track. You know, it, it certainly has just been, you know, really apparent to me in the last couple of years that kind of national organisations are starting to set standards that are really articulating diversity within those. And that, you know, that's the first step. And then there's much more to come beyond that. It's really people being aware of what it's going to take to actually have really good engagement and seeing the result of it. Because when you see the result of actually when this works well, we get so much more, you know, for individuals on the ground, that's, you know, that's going to be really valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, I think we are, unless there is more questions, we're kind of getting towards the end of the session. This has been I've taken so much from it personally myself, so it's been great to be in the box seat. Um, but there's um, plenty more you can sort of learn from Rima's work. So um, Chrissy's just telling me to let you know that AIHI underscore MQ is our Twitter handle, and we'll be um, linking to all of the papers that Rima's kind of mentioned or sort of highlighted throughout her presentation. Um, and the session will also be shortly available, shortly soonly soon to be available on the AIHI YouTube page um, and you'll receive a link where you can go and have a look at it again if you would like to watch it again or kind of look at specific things that Rima mentioned um, and you'll also receive sort of future notifications about upcoming seminars so um, I think that's it Rima did you have anything further you wanted to add before we close the session no, thanks so much. Thanks so much for taking the time to um, listen today. And thanks, Kate, for uh, hosting as well. No worries. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Have a, have a wonderful day. Bye, all.